Dr. Melba Vasquez is our next to last speaker. And uh, Dr. Vasquez, who was recently um, elected to the Board of Directors of the American Psychological Association, and who's our treasurer of the division, is also in full-time independent practice in Austin, Texas. She publishes extensively in the area of professional ethics, ethnic minority psychology, psychology of women, and supervision and training. Uh, she has provided leadership service as president of APA Divisions 35, which is psychology of women, and 17, psychology of women. And as I mentioned, she's just been elected to serve on the APA Board of Directors beginning this January, which is really very exciting. Oh. Well, um, I don't know about you, Judy and I were commenting on how upsetting this is, this information, and, and um, I'm going to close this if I can. Um, that doesn't do anything to... Um, you know, wh one of the things that's true is that ethnic minority clients, people of color, experience the same kinds of trauma and horrors that others do. Um, the, um, I just checked uh, with Lenore and uh, it is still true that there's approximately the same percentage of battered women among women of color as in the general population. Uh, unfortunately, pe people of color are overrepresented um, as veterans and you know we are undereducated and underemployed in this country but we're overrepresented in um, you know this profession in the military, which uh, is not a positive one uh, these days. And even though I don't have the figures, I'm sure that there are many people of color who are survivors of clergy abuse as well. I've certainly seen them in, in my practice. Traumatic, this traumatic stress, I hypothesize as an additional major detriment to the health and well-being of people who've experienced chronic poverty, injustice, and or discrimination. Discrimination is indeed a major source of stress. Many have conceptualized these experiences as either direct or insidious trauma. The relevant research literature about the traumatic effects of discrimination have been evolving. Maria Root, for example, conceptualized how people of color experience insidious chronic trauma through the experience of discrimination. This has a long-term effect and we're beginning to see documentation of some of those effects uh, by works such as Claude Steele's st Stereotype Threat. Stereotype threat is a phenomenon that happens for people of color when they believe that certain negative stereotypes about their abilities um, are, are in, in process. For example, um, if they take a standardized test and have been told or have information that people of color tend not to score well on those tests, they tend to get threatened, anxious, and to underperform. Shame, anxiety, and fear may lead to attempts to try harder, to choke under pressure, and perform significantly lower than they would under non-threatening conditions. Research has begun to emerge to identify vulnerabilities of certain groups as well as protective factors for, for groups. For example, Paul Best uh, Metzler Marmar, for example, found that Hispanic American police have higher rates of post-traumatic stress disorder than non-Hispanic Caucasian and black American police, and that greater perceived racism was one of the important variables in explaining the elevated PTSD symptoms. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the study in a little bit. I'm going to refer briefly to the APA multicultural guidelines to provide suggestions for developing tr competency in the tra trauma treatment of multicultural families and children. The multicultural guidelines were developed because the fact is that racial and ethnic diversity among clients and patients presents challenges for all of us. We tend to relate most easily in our lives as well as in our practices to those most similar to us, including in regard to the major variables of gender, ethnicity, and social class. So I'd like to focus on two of the multicultural guidelines that inform practice. Um, the first one essentially states that you need to be aware of your worldview. You need to be aware of yourself and your biases. No matter how egalitarian you identify, the fact is that we all have those biases and awarenesses and it's important to be uh, clear about when those are in operation. The second guideline essentially says that you need to understand the cultural experiences and background of your clients. 
We're encouraged to learn how cultures differ in basic premises that shape worldview of individuals from those cultures. The risk in not being aware of your worldview as well as that of your racial minority client is that, is that one may unconsciously and automatically judge the client negatively and perhaps in a pathological manner. A common example has to do with the degree of value of independence of white Western culture, which in turn has influenced the evolution of, the and theory, of theory and practice in psychotherapy versus that of other groups such as Asian American or Latina Latino families. A cultural facet of mainstream American culture is a preference for individuals who are independent, focused on achievement and success, who have, who are de who have determined, are in, are in control of their own personal goals, and who value rational decision making. These are not bad values, these are American values. From this perspective, a basic developmental task for all individuals, based on our psychological theories, is the individuation process, right? Part of normal development is to individuate. You grow up and you move away from your primary family. We often assess whether a young adult, for example, is appropriately involved in the process of individuation or separation from one's primary family, and a client can be labeled pathologically dependent if we judge that they're still relying on their family of origin to an abnormal degree, or we label them codependent if they're too involved in helping their family uh, to what we consider an abnormal degree. By contrast, individuals with origins in different cultures, such as Latina and Latino cultures, tend to have a preference for those who have a group community identity, tend to be very family-oriented, and are cooperatively oriented. Latino or Latina sons and daughters tend to live at home longer than white counterparts in young adulthood, and they also make all kinds of decisions based on primacy of family identity and closeness. This includes, for example, choosing to live at home or not move far away to attend college, prioritizing amount of vacation time spent with family. Uh, these choices from some ethno ethnic and racial minority worldviews do not necessarily constitute pathological dependency. Um, I'm going to give a case example um, with this issue that happened just in the past few days in my practice. And as I talk about cases, by the way, I just want to give a disclaimer that I've done some work to try to disguise these so I can maintain confidentiality. So I had a Latina client call me a few weeks ago, and um, I've only seen her twice. She entered therapy in distress about various issues in a relationship, a teenage daughter. Then, actually, before I saw her for the second time, she called and canceled because she had a crisis. A younger brother who was married with children was arrested. So she canceled her session because she flew out of state to go and, and help him deal with that, with that situation. When she came back, she called me, still in crisis about all of this that was going on, but especially because when she explained to her psychiatrist, she had been to a psychiatrist first, by the way, uh, because she'd been pretty severely depressed and her psychiatrist had appropriately referred her for psychotherapy as well. When she explained to the psychiatrist why she canceled the appointment to fly to another state and spend time, effort, energy, money to raise bonds and find an attorney for her brother, this psychiatrist, according to my client, yelled at her, called her codependent and too easily manipulated by her evil, good-for-nothing bum of a brother. My client was traumatized. This was in a session with the psychiatrist when she had returned. In, in the second session, when, when she came in, she just wept and wept and wept as she described her shock and offense at the, at the depiction of her beloved brother um, by this psychiatrist. While the psychiatrist certainly made a mistake, um, my client uh, was incredibly hurt, traumatized, and then enraged that this psychiatrist would say such horrible things about someone she didn't know. She felt that she and her family had been stereotyped and disparaged unfairly. She refused to return to this psychiatrist and was not ready to return and provide feedback. We talked about that option. Uh, she felt too unsafe and unfortunately was traumatized by someone who was, who was uh, supposed to be providing help. Um, this, the, the, the psychiatrist, who I've not spoken to, no doubt was coming out of her models of the importance of separation from one's family of origin, um, you know, in order to provide, you know, self-care and your own boundaries and all that kind of stuff, which is not, you know, 
possibly from her own issues as, as well, I don't know. You know, the, the reality is that generally women of color, and this is a broad generalization, but there is a little bit of, of, of support of this in the, in the literature, um, tend to support loved ones who get into trouble partly because of familial values, but also partly because we know that the justice system is often biased in the treatment of people of color. I worked with this client to support her to validate her feelings, but also acknowledge her confusion about her split loyalties. Her, her spouse her, her, was also giving her a hard time. She's Latina and he's white. He does not understand her over, what he calls her over-involvement in her family. Uh, so she was feeling guilt all the way around. And so we talked about how we would sort out how to help um, and, and find where the boundaries should be for her, but that we would slowly figure that out. Um, so in the long run, we may do some boundary setting, and we may you know, help her see where she may, ha may have a tendency to give to her own detriment, but in a, in a, in a compassionate way. It's so important to do this work uh, in a compassionate way with somebody like this. I'd like to say more about the effects of insidious trauma on people of color. Steel stereotype threat research indicates that when ethnic minorities, again, are asked to perform in a task where ethnic minorities stereotypically underperform, they end up underperforming due to the anxiety, fear, and threat. Um, ethnic minority clients may experience negative judgment, rejection, and criticalness on the part of white therapists without the white therapist being aware of this. John DeVidio, a social, uh, social psychologist, has done research to show that employers, uh, counselors, um, uh, have uh, a tendency to um, um, interview white applicants very differently than they do people of color. And he's, ha he's done all kinds of uh, research to uh, you know, have observations of these interviews, and you can see the difference in, in body language. Uh, from the white employer, the white counselor, admissions counselor in the university. And, you know, you, he asks afterwards, they debrief the interviewer, did you feel differently in your, oh no, I've treated everybody, this, you know, everybody. and you ask the person of color, how did this person interact with you? They did not like me, they did not make eye contact, they were cold, their tone was, was brusque, and so on. So people of color are aware of those different differences, and, and people were not. Let me give you a personal example. I was talking to a neighbor who's fairly liberal about social issues about my reaction to a clothing company who allegedly produced a batch of t-shirts, this was a few months ago, uh, that read, visit New Mexico, it's cleaner than old Mexico. This issue was being discussed on the listserv of the National Latino Psychological Association and, and that's how I became aware of this and I was, I was discharging about it to my, my, my neighbor as we walked, we, do, we, walk, we walk on a regular basis, and my neighbor said, well, does that t-shirt bother you? And I said, absolutely, it's offensive. And I saw her purse her lips in a way, um, in a response that I read as a version of eye rolling, you know, that kind of, <laughs> kind of thing, that kind of says she's overreacting, she's overly sensitive, and I felt myself flush I felt that sort of, you know, insidious PTSD response. I felt a combination of anger, I felt shame and disappointment from the lack of support. Now this was a neighbor friend who was not a therapist. If I, if I had said something like that to a therapist and my therapist had responded unconsciously in that manner, that, that would have been horrific. Now, with my neighbor, I could have just shrugged it off and just tucked away the knowledge about this area in which I could not trust her, which I do on a regular basis with a lot of people. But I felt the need to have her understand what happens to those of us who were raised to feel like second-class citizens. To be called dirty Mexican on the playground while growing up is traumatic and hurtful. I did explain some of the following to my friend. It helped, again, that we were walking. Um, Cynthia de las Fuentes and I wrote a chapter in Mary Brabeck's book on feminist ethics entitled Hate Speech or Freedom of Expression, Balancing Autonomy and Feminist Ethics in a Pluralistic Society. In that discussion with my neighbor, I pulled on the basic premise um, to explain myself. I see the t-shirt as a version of hate speech. 
and I renounce hate speech of any kind, not because I support censorship, but because I want an elimination of those attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors that contribute to oppression, to marginalization, and disempowerment of traditionally uh, disenfranchised and marginalized groups. Hateful comments and jokes can lead to physical violence, but has more often negative emotional impact, including what Maria Root calls insidious trauma that shapes worldview and identity. This in turn leads to anxiety, depression, paranoia, heightened sensitivity, irritability, anger, or hostility. Even those of us who are resilient must expend energy to deal with the reactions that result from various forms and levels of hate speech, negative comments, negative judgments, and various forms of rejection. The essential experience of being treated unfairly by virtue of belonging to an identity group is traumatizing for most of us. I can't tell you how many of us talk about whether we lost sleep over something like that or not. You know, part of, part of developing um, resilience and wisdom is, is to be able to say, well, that bothered me, but I didn't lose sleep over it, because we often do. These are the kinds of experiences that Daryl Wing Sue calls microaggressions. Ruth Fassinger speaks um, of a thousand points of slights that people from marginalized groups experience regularly in the toll that it takes. When these attitudes are pervasive in society, we suffer tremendously. In the words of Greenwald and Banaji, and I quote, social structure creates cognitive structure. Policies to limit biases alter our social structure, and this has a compounding effect on our cognitive structures and ultimately our social attitudes and beliefs about people. The way society constructs societal representations of groups affects the social order and has tremendous impact on the identities of individuals in various groups, both ethnic minority and white majority. Um, for example, I mentioned earlier that um, uh, studies have been found that Mexican um, Hispanic Americans or Latinos have higher rates of PTSD than non-Hispanic, Caucasian, and African Americans. There are about four different studies. Um, future research is needed to d understand the extent to which this is tr true for the population of Latinos at large. Studies have been conducted with Hispanic military veterans as well as police officers. Um, I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to skip through that. The, the hypothesis is that um, African Americans may be provided with more coping strategies to deal with discrimination by their families and communities and are thus not as, significant, not as significantly affected by trauma as are Latinos or Latinas who may have a tendency to deny that discrimination is out there and then when they meet with it it's a, a bit more traumatic. But that's just a hypothesis. More, more work needs to be done. Um, let me just go ahead and make some suggestions for intervention. Um, the issue of assessment is important. A an additional layer of assessment is to assess the person's experience of oppression, how they've coped in healthy ways, how they've coped in unhealthy ways. Anger um, can be destructive. People can burn bridges on a regular basis, or it can be used to channel uh, in a constructive way uh, for, for persistence and motivation. And, and, um, but it's important not to blame the victim. It's also important to identify strengths and resilience of the client. That's been mentioned in previous talks. It's especially true, I think, for people of color. Uh, and there are many, many strengths among people, which I'm not going to, I don't have time to go into right now. Um, there are all kinds of interesting um, studies out there. For example, in Texas, Latina women uh, are expected to live the longest in any other group. And there are all kinds of interesting reasons for that, um, hypothesized once again. But we have to find the strengths uh, among groups. Um, so uh, l let me just go ahead and stop there because there's, we, we have three more speakers and the time has run out. Uh, but um, uh, thank you very much. Thank you.